Hey everyone, my name is Rob Harrell and I'm Fiddler's product manager. And as the tools and best practices used to train machine learning models have matured over the past several years, there's been a shift toward focusing on streamlining operationalization of machine learning in a scalable and responsible manner. And in the true broad steps within operationalization are deployment and ongoing observation of production models. So this panel and discussion will focus on the need for AI observability and key considerations for adding observability to an organization's AI infrastructure stack. And with me to discuss this topic are Natalia Barina, Kenny Daniel, Abhishek Gupta, and Pete Skamarak. So we'll begin the panel with a brief round of introductions and then dive into our discussion. Natalia, could you please introduce yourself first? Yeah, my name is Natalia Barina. I'm a product manager uh, at Facebook in the AI org. Uh, so yeah, been there for two and a half years, having an awesome time. Great to have you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Kenny. Yeah, hey, I'm Kenny Daniel. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Algorithmia. We're a platform for productionization and management of AI workloads. Uh, so we're really focused on kind of those latter stages of, of the ML life cycle. And, and we see a lot of this, uh, the monitoring and, and uh, that, that side of things. Awesome. Abhishek? Hi, I'm Abhishek Gupta. I'm currently head of engineering at Hired. Hired is a jobs marketplace for uh, tech folks like software engineers, engineering managers, product managers, and designers. Great. And finally, Pete. Hi, I'm Pete Skamrock. Uh, I'm an angel investor and advisor uh, focusing on machine learning mostly. Uh, and prior to that, uh, I had I was CEO and co-founder of a startup called Skip Flag that uh, did large scale NLP on conversations in Slack, email and things like that. Wonderful. Well, uh, we're very excited to have you all. And to kick things off, I wanted to start at a more high level. So most businesses today are either in the middle of implementing or considering implementing their AI strategies. And Andrew Eng famously frames this as starting with identifying the right use cases and hiring the right practitioners, consolidating data in a way that can be used to train models, and then ultimately productionizing those models. Um, and over the course of the past year or two, or maybe a couple of uh, several years, as, AI, as companies' AI programs have matured, have you observed a shift toward a focus on operations? And maybe we can start off with Pete and then move on from there. Yeah, um, this is really interesting. A lot of uh, the companies that I'm working with or that I, I've looked at uh, are selling to companies who um, are trying to scale up their machine learning or, or in, improve their productivity with machine learning um, or just building out a new team. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we had the wave of big data, uh, Hadoop, Spark, things like that, really people working on their data infrastructure for quite some time, often to help power analytics on their site, right? And uh, you can imagine um, tracking metrics about how your products are doing and you have all that data flowing and then they move into the world of machine learning um, and then I think growing pains really kick in because engineering, a lot of engineering monitoring and practice, practices are based around um, software that you write, you test, and then you push to the site. Um, and you may A-B test it for effectiveness, um, but the, the software itself isn't changing and adapting continuously. Whereas with machine learning, your distribution of data is changing. Um, the, uh, uh, the quality of what's happening with your model. We all saw this with COVID, right? Um, one company I was working with when COVID hit, um, they had to rapidly retrain their models and they had to try it in different ways. They weren't sure what was going to work um, for something like, say, ad impressions, right? Um, when all of a sudden, all the demographics changed of what people were interested in clicking on, uh, they had to change and retrain their models rapidly because um, the data distribution had shifted. So I think that's becoming more the norm. We, we were living this every day. The change is, is real and continuous. 
It's interesting you make that point about changing and shifting data due to COVID. And, and we at Fiddler have seen indications of that across industries. And in fact, there's one person at least on this panel, another person who has intimate knowledge of that. So um, yeah, I'm curious, Abhishek, whether you all have and hired has had to make any changes with result to some of the shifting data trends over the past six to nine months. Yeah, so actually before answering that, I wanted to just sort of, you know, highlight at a high level, uh, you know, the answer to your prior question, which is, yes, absolutely. The maturity, you know, in my experience generally follows kind of the following sort of three steps. I mean, stage one is establishing a clear connection of sort of business metrics, product metrics, and an AI metric that can be directly optimized. And it's quite uh, important to establish this and revisit this. And oftentimes it would require some initial prototyping and ideally something in production to demonstrate the value. Uh, many sort of companies uh, sort of who are starting with AI sort of are in this stage. Second sort of stage would be, you know, having robustness around tracking data, attracting strong AI talent, ability to launch AI models quickly and get feedback and iterate. And once, you know, something uh, is sort of so important where it directly impacts sort of the business level KPI and it's powered by AI, then, you know, the need for explainable monitoring uh, becomes critical and this saves a lot of time for ML engineers who can utilize the time to make improvements. It also helps sort of improve sort of the intuition around which areas are uh, fo focused, worth focusing more on versus less on. And in terms of sort of the COVID uh, impact, I mean, um, this is kind of surreal and unreal situation. For us, we are a marketplace where, you know, people apply for jobs and then we have demand. So at the start of COVID, we suddenly saw like uh, our sort of models uh, sort of behave sort of less ideally where uh, a very large portion of sort of supply that we had on the platform suddenly were not getting enough outreach because uh, companies were, you know, not thinking of hiring as much. And, and that combined with the fact that we got two to three X more candidates suddenly on the platform really made us question, you know, is there a bug in the system? Like what's going on? And really there was no deployment. It was just, you know, the macro environment sort of shifted and sort of in July and August, what we saw is, you know, suddenly now we're seeing an uptick in terms of, you know, uh, employers sending IBRs, uh, interview requests. And interestingly enough, bigger companies that uh, previously weren't as interested in uh, hiring remotely or reaching out to folks who've had remote experience, those kinds of people were getting no interest uh, in the marketplace or very little. And suddenly they've become like, you know, the hottest and sort of highest quality talent. And so, you know, uh, the AI model historically trained on sort of data assets in the past aren't sort of equipped to uh, sort of, uh, you know, learn this uh, without enough sample size. So these are some of the examples uh, that sort of COVID is impacting directly as it pertains to training models frequently and sort of uh, uh, following kind of the macro trends. Great, that's fascinating. And and before we move on to our next question, Kenny and, and Natalia, I wanted to make sure that you have time to weigh in on these broad macro sort of steps that companies are walking through and or the effects of COVID on the need to observe and monitor AI. Yeah, yeah I, I can, mean, uh, oh, please go ahead, sorry. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, so, so just uh, at, a, at a high level, there's definitely been a shift towards operations with the rise of ML ops. Um, a recent report gave the figure that 25% of the top 20 fastest growing GitHub projects in Q2 2020 concern ML infrastructure, uh, tooling, and operations. Uh, and Google Search has seen an uptick uh, on this. Um, explainability and monitoring are really a key piece of this. Teams needed to monitor uh, models throughout training. Uh, training, validation, and deployment. So really the whole life cycle. And then uh, I'm gonna make one last point and then hand it over to Kenny um, and then uh, uh, related to COVID. So uh, at Facebook, we've been using AI to help uh, help experts address the COVID-19 pandemic by producing country level forecasts of the spread of COVID-19 across the US. So it's some of the related work, not necessarily monitoring uh, that, that we have coming out of the org. Uh, thanks, I'm gonna hand it over to Kim. Yeah, well, I just had to kind of one one quick note of just, you know, kind of in the data science communities that I run in and things. And, you know, it was a picture of a time series, any time series. And, you know, it looks normal, seasonal, year, year after year, and then just COVID hit. And 
you know, it's different for finance or for, for users or for whatever it is, but it's just, this is every time series you will look at now for the next X years as a data <laughs> scientist. And so, you know, if you don't have a way of recognizing when you're totally out of uh, the input distribution, like you're going to have problems. Like the airlines experienced exactly this because all of their pricing algorithms are automatic these days because they have to compute so many of them. So when COVID hit, prices just dropped through the floor because the algorithms thought that was the way to get people to, to get flying again, but it didn't recognize that there was no elasticity in a pandemic, so. Yeah, it's it's a very, uh, it's an interesting time certainly that uh, I'm sure will be discussed and studied going forward. And so Natalia, you sort of touched on this in, in your response, but when we uh, specifically consider the machine learning practitioners who are responsible for the deployment and operationalization and monitoring uh, and, and these could be data scientists or machine learning engineers or ML ops stakeholders, depending on the company. Um, how do we think about the relationship between what they need to do with respect to continuous monitoring, but also the ability to drill down and understand how the model is actually working uh, at a detailed level by leveraging explainability? Um, yeah. So sorry, sorry, just make sure I understand the question. How do we think about the ML uh, practitioners uh, looking at, can you repeat? How do we think about uh, just the, the various sub functions within observability and really focusing on monitoring and explainability, the need for both as opposed to one or the other, let's say. Is monitoring alone enough or explainability enough or do you uh, see a need yeah. for the, the combination of the two? When there, sort of there's, there's really um, a need for both. Uh, really important use cases require continuous monitoring. And so something like bias and fairness with respect to vulnerable groups is, is a very high stake use case where you have to have, have that. Um, and that's something to, to focus on industry-wide for everyone. I think explainability to me is really the next step and it helps you drill down and debug and understand what's happening uh, at, at a lower level. The debugging models is really a something that's, um, I think of it as, as, as something that's developing. Uh, we don't have in the industry a very good way of doing this like we have in traditional software. So that's something I'm actually very passionate about. Um, and monitoring to me is a key piece of that. And monitoring has to happen throughout the entire life cycle. So it, this is really important, crucial, um, and has implications for end users. And again, most importantly for very high stake use cases when you're dealing with fairness and, and um, vulnerable groups, for example. I mean, I have an opinionated sort of view on this personally, uh, you know, for me, like monitoring it. First of all, I'm a happy Fiddler customer. So, uh, you know, uh, take whatever I say with a little bit of sort of bias here, but for good reason, for me, like uh, ML monitoring and ability to drill down and explain uh, stuff is sort of inextricably linked and then effective monitoring needs explainable AI monitoring. And so, uh, and then the reason for that is it allows for fast detection of issues, fast resolution of issues. It also helps ML engineers develop a better intuition around uh, which areas are worth spending more time and energy on. And while also, uh, you know, giving us complete visibility and uh, it uh, finally helps folks develop a stronger appreciation toward the robust ML infrastructure stack. So I think, uh, you know, Fiddler's tool and explainable monitoring has really been uh, kind of a game changer as it pertains to a step function improvement on how we monitor and react to challenges as we see in the marketplace. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I, I can chime in on this as well. I think um, monitoring is important in general, um, but with machine learning specifically, we've seen, uh, you know, things will go wrong, right? Like you have to assume that things will go wrong um, and your machine learning team will be under the gun to, to fix it quickly. Um, and the problem is, so the two sides of this are looking at your data, understanding what's happening, um, and then figuring out why it's happening, right? So in your models, um, if you have a model that you can't interrogate where you can't determine why you know, the accuracy is dropping, um, that's a very stressful situation. So uh, you know, it's, it's common in companies that are operational with machine learning that there's you know, some Monday staff meeting where people are looking at metrics and then the, uh, the shit kind of flows downhill 
and it goes all the way down to you know some M machine learning engineer with their manager breathing to over over their neck saying what's going on why is this dropping and it's a stressful you know 24 hours or 36 hours until they debug it and resolve it and we need better debugging tools um, so i think this is why you know stuff like builder is pretty exciting um, because a lot of this is just you know done manually um, currently um, and ad hoc and it's very uh, you know it's, it's very difficult there's like some notebooks flying around and emails um, we really need to you know have benchmarks that we're looking at consistently and continuously um, and so things like uh, Facebook acquired papers with code and there's uh, a soda bench uh, framework there where they track different machine learning metrics with algorithms Basically, every company needs something like that for the particular problems that their machine learning applies to um, running continuously. Uh, that is indeed something that we've observed with many of the customers we're working with. Uh, and so I guess as we think about this, this operationalization and, and sort of the observability, the explainability and monitoring piece and how that plugs into an overall AI infrastructure stack do we feel there's a trend toward all-in-one or monolithic solutions uh, or, or are companies taking more of a heterogeneous or best in breed approach that combines open source, custom software and various vendor solutions when uh, building out their end-to-end -end AI lifecycle infrastructure and tooling stack? And I wanted to, to start with Kenny here. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've got a, a lot of thoughts on this. Um, you know, first of all, I, I don't think there's a trend towards an all-in-one end-to-end platform. Uh, and, you know, kind of to bring it back to a point Natalia was making, I think, earlier about just drawing an analogy between ML software and what we call traditional software, you know, pre-ML, like web services and, and applications and things like that. And I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that, both in terms of the, the tools and things that go into it. But, you know, over the decades that we've been building software, there hasn't been a trend in traditional software towards, you know, big monolithic end-to-end -end platforms. I mean, you see companies in, in every project really assembling uh, different components that solve the problem uh, you know, as best as possible. And the more valuable and, and the more important a project is, the more you really wanna have the best component for for each bit. So, you know, in traditional software, that's combining different source control, you know, GitHub with different CI, CD, with different testing, with different monitoring and different observability. And, you know, despite how much has been invested by, you know, giants like Amazon and things, they're still not, you know, people are still not moving towards the, the, the all end all one solution um, because, you know, the needs are so diverse across different companies and different use cases. And so ultimately, you know, your choice of, of database and CI and monitoring and, and all this is, is going to be very different in these worlds. So, uh, you know, I, I think that even for a large company, you know, you can't build the end, you know, the end to end solution and expect to succeed in an industry that's evolving so quickly, you need to be able to switch out parts of the car while it's driving because you know the things that were popular two years ago, you know, are, are, are not today, you know, you see the shift even in frameworks for for deep learning and things like that, but there, there's 100 different examples of those sorts of things shifting really quickly. Is anyone else seeing this sort of dichotomy here and or and or have an opinion on whether the monolithic well, or the piecemeal approach would is more strategic yeah. i can speak to it so i think you know as uh, natalia mentioned kenny mentioned there's a lot of innovation happening in sort of the ai tech stack and uh, i see that happening for the foreseeable future as well and that's sort of great uh, great for everyone as an example you know uh, aws offers search functionality but elastic.co's uh, you know elastic cloud is uh, better for many companies including ours uh, AWS offers Kinesis, uh, but you know Confluence Kafka is better for many companies, including ours. And you know AWS SageMaker offers monitoring as well. But I mean Fiddler's product is better for many companies, including ours as well. And and we're seeing insane amount of sort of talented people who uh, build their careers uh, at companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon. They kind of you know uh, identifying these like specific business problems and like building out tools. Uh, Fiddler again is a great example. And so I, I expect that to happen for the next maybe two to four years. And it's sort of great for the AI ecosystem because. Uh, a lot of time historically got spent in just sort of getting the ML models like working in production and sort of making sure that they're stable. And now uh, increasingly uh, lots and lots of pieces of that are getting, uh, you know, sassified by uh, a variety of sort of open source products. 
well put. And I want to I want to give anyone else the opportunity to speak before we head to the next question. I just want to make a quick quick point. So I totally agree with Abhishek and Kenny. Um, as companies start their ML journey, they they may start with something that that may look monolithic, but as they scale, they will hit limits of, of monolithic solutions, and then they start to veer towards the best of breed solutions. And for companies that are serious from the get go, they should really consider best of breed solutions because that that's going to be the com their competitive advantage. Yeah, I think the other thing I'd add is um, if you rewind, you know, six seven years ago, most company, there were fewer companies doing machine learning at scale and the preference was usually build over buy, right? That's the way you get promoted as an ML engineer is to make your own framework. But um, the land grab in some sense has happened for the major pieces of the stack. And you're not gonna re, it's not a good use of your time if you're a startup uh, to have your ML engineer write from scratch new optimization libraries, right? Like it doesn't make sense. So I, I do think um, people are looking at, you know, GitHub stars or, you know, whatever, whatever their metrics are, look, look at what are the best things for X, Y, Z. Unfortunately, there's like, you know, 50 or 60 things in the stack probably right now, um, uh, that you have to kind of pick and choose between. Um, but I think w what someone said earlier, uh, is, is right. I mean, Kenny, uh, it really depends on your domain, right? Like, are you doing image recognition? Are you doing audio conversational agents? So there's a lot of tools and pieces out there, but uh, depending on the domain, depending on what you're working on, some are more or less important. 100%. And there is so much additional infrastructure and tooling that has to surround these production AI systems. And so oftentimes uh, in our conversations with customers, we ask data science organizations what they view their core proprietary IP and use case to be. And really it's the data and the modeling and the integrations with their production services and applications. And that should be the core focus for machine learning engineers and data science, not all of the peripheral tooling and, and whether it's monitoring or distributed training frameworks or anything of that nature. Okay, so 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 far we've we've sort of focused on uh, this observability and, and data scientists and machine learning engineers and technical practitioners and model developers, but when thinking about production AI more broadly within a company, um, are there additional types of stakeholders within a business who require visibility into how models are operating and what sorts of insights do those stakeholders need? I, I can take this one. Um, uh, there are a number of different stakeholders. So uh, starting with, of course, data, data or research scientists, depending on what people call them, they're different, different companies. Uh, and they, of course, require visibility into how models are operating when debugging them and looking for ways to improve uh, performance. Uh, so it's one, two product managers like myself, uh, we care about the fit of a model with business strategy and purpose. Um, three, there's legal. Is, is really big, of course. Increasingly, um, number four is regulators who are more and more interested in um, issues around AI regulation. Uh, of course, not to miss consumers uh, or customers when we talk about enterprise. And I predict the emergence of a, a new role, uh, or, you know, going, harking back to, to some of what we were talking about earlier. Um, which I'm going to call the model quality scientist. So somebody who would really challenge the model, check it for robustness, uh, including anything that could be adversarial. This is a really interesting new, uh, well, it's not new, but it, it's happening. Thinking about adversarial implications uh, of model is, is really important. Um, and then finally, somebody who would approve the deployment. So really make it more systematic and, and a rigorous process. And they, they would be kind of like your personal trainers for both your model and your pipeline. I really feel that there's a need, need for something like that industry-wide. Um, I think that would be huge. I mean, I can jump in, but yeah, I mean, I think that this this idea of the personas is is really important thing to to touch on there, um, and it's something that as organizations get more mature with their machine learning and AI, like it becomes more and more relevant. Um, and I think that it's really key to think about it from that point of view if you don't want projects getting stuck in the lab. Um, and we see this a lot at companies where they'll they'll have higher teams of data scientists, you know, try to start making sense of all that data they've been collecting over over the decades, big data and all. Um, 
and you know maybe even be producing models that are of good quality but if you're not thinking about you know how am i going to get this deployed how am i going to get this approved how do i get buy in from the organization uh, you know it's really easy for it to as i said get stuck in the lab and so you know again there's lessons to be learned from traditional software there's you know the devops role like it, in you know early stages of, of kind of like us learning to do this, you know, the same piece, person writing a web server might be the one deploying and monitoring and ma making sure it's reliable, but they're very different skill sets. And the same is true here. You know, you can spend decades learning the math and the art of modeling and, and working with data is a very different problem of how do I deploy something in a reliable way and in a way that, you know, hopefully I don't get woken up uh, being paged at two in the morning because a model broke or something something weird is happening. Like it's fundamentally very different skill sets. Uh, and then also even different than the, the DevOps persona is the people who are ultimately responsible uh, in, in the sense of, you know, they need to, they either have product ownership or, or even literal liability uh, for, for the, outcomes of this model. And so making sure that there's there's tooling and processes that fit all those people in, I think is really critical to, to success. Yeah, I, I think the other trend I, I've seen, um, we started this mentioning, you know, scientists, machine learning scientists. So if companies have more of a separate team or they have a, a, a lab, an ML labs group that's off building, um, there's often a disconnect between the business and uh, what's happening in machine learning. Um, it's easy when you're in the thick of it and most of the people probably here are experts um, at, at this conference or practitioners, but there's a whole world of people who um, don't really understand what you do day to day. Um, and so it's the whole, the whole team is a kind of a black box to them. So there's a side benefit of having something like Fiddler, having this observability and, and, and um, monitoring happening, which is they have something to look at where they can see, well, what's the progress, right? What's happening with our machine learning models? Um, without that, the business unit is often in the dark and they're just waiting, you know, they could be waiting months for some explanation as to, you know, how the team is doing. Um, and so having this, Kind of collaborative environment where people can actually see what's happening beyond your your ML engineers is pretty important. Absolutely, just building upon uh, Pete, you know, in addition to the connection of business metrics, product metrics, and sort of uh, AI metric that can be directly optimized, as as Pete mentioned, sometimes there could be a lag between you know folks doing stuff and some value getting generated, and sort of demystifying uh, sort of AI by virtue of allowing people to, you know, sort of quote unquote fiddle with the, with the inputs and develop an intuition around how that impacts the output really goes a long way in terms of trust building so that folks can really appreciate how difficult it is to generate incremental value and also see, you know, a potential impact of those decisions as well. So uh, that's been really helpful in addition to obviously the usual stuff of, you know, bi-weekly updates and so on and so forth. But this is kind of a net new where you just empower and allow folks to see uh, see it in action, even though they're not practitioners. And so have you all observed uh, the, the visibility into models operations or business impact or even the regulatory and risk aspects of a model? Have you seen an interest from the C-suite even in being able to understand what's going on operationally and, and weigh in strategically? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's actually a lot of where it is driven from is, is from from the top there of wanting to understand. And I think that's a number of reasons. I mean, I think it's part it's one is that, you know, they're ultimately going to be responsible for, for these decisions. And so there, there's a lot of pressure there. Um, but also, you know, to the point that was just made of, you know, understanding, you know, the, the C-suite is often not going to be experts at ML and data science. And if you don't understand something, there's going to be more fear and, and nervousness around it. And that's where I think that explainability can, can help allay some of that fear. Uh, yeah, I, I think even seeing things like distributions, when, it, when an issue happens, issues will happen. They're going to continue to happen with machine learning models. There'll be problems, there'll be bugs that'll affect certain types of people. Um, and that, the, the, a big question is how often is this happening? Is this, an, is this unusual or is this systematic, right? Um, those kinds of questions, until recently, there really haven't been good tools to investigate that kind of issue. Um, and so everything looks like a fire um, when it may not be. 
Um, just one thing to add there from my time actually at Salesforce when I worked on enterprise AI. Um, to answer your question, yeah, we always saw a ton of interest from the C-suite um, just from, from the time that I, I worked there with different companies. But I think the key thing to understand or to explain to people at C-suite is that it's not like traditional software uh, where you have code and algorithms and rules that behave predictably. Really, the C-suite needs to understand that AI systems are probabilistic and Actually, I think Pete, this is one of the, the, the points you made in, in one of your, your excellent posts around product management for AI. Um, and I think that's the really the, the key thing to explain to the C-suite when you talk about them. This is different. And there's always gonna be that element of where you can't 100% predict what's going to happen. Just as a minor note, which builds upon uh, these uh, points of views, uh, there are sort of real trade-offs involved. And so I think, uh, what, what it sort of helps is, hey, if you want to drive more engagement versus sort of revenue or drive this metric or that metric, there are certain sort of trade-offs and sort of Pareto optimal curve. So without going into too much details, just having a shared understanding of the levers and the trade-offs and then having conversation at that abstraction uh, sort of really goes a long way. And, and AI can drive a lot of that uh, sort of trade-off uh, 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 decision points. I want to just chime in on that because the other thing we've, all, we've probably all seen, uh, it's it's so much more complex than people think. So uh, if you have a lot of features going into a model, you know, um, it's like pushing on a rug. So changing one thing can have ripple effects, and then you need to retrain. And so the complexity level of this is so much higher than, like uh, you mentioned, the deterministic software where it's kind of one and done. You write, you know, hard coded rules essentially. Uh, the, the application works as expected. Um, and so I think this starts to bleed into almost thinking about then how do, what's normal? How do you set up bands of what's a normal behavior for a model? Um, it's very different than traditional testing, which is uh, more uh, true or false, right? Now it's like, like Natalia said, it's more probabilistic. Yeah, that's that. Just to, I know I already spoke on this one, but the, the the testing thing is really interesting. I mean, testing is built into the the fabric of machine learning, but in a certain sense, it's often very one dimensional. It's that loss function or it's that accuracy function. But really, there's there's so many dimensions that you should that we should be testing on, frankly. It's interesting, many of the customers we engage with have fairly robust testing and validation stages for their, you know, releasing new models. But when it comes to the post deployed, it's like, okay, we're going to let this thing run our business or run this application for a couple of months and only collect the feedback, you know, as it's been gathered over over time. And so, um, yeah, bringing faster visibility and, and, and more actionability into that feedback loop closing and, and reducing the, the time lag there is something that we're trying to do. T testing in production is now a good thing, right? <laughs> Indeed. Um, okay, so, so shifting gears a little bit toward algorithmic bias and fairness, which has been such a relevant topic lately, both just due to where we are with uh, the elections and what you see on the news on a weekly basis. Um, there doesn't really appear to be an industry standard best practice yet. The industry just hasn't converged on a solution. So I'm curious where you all see bias and fairness playing a role within AI observability, monitoring and explainability. And you know, do you think it makes sense for companies to begin thinking about it and, and start really trying to put an effort behind it? We can start at Natalia maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, what I would say first is bias and fairness is something that people need to start thinking about first and foremost before they start building. Um, and in the realm of different AI use cases where it's especially important is when there's things that are high stakes, um, or for example, it depends whether or not somebody is going to get a loan is, is one, one example that's often used. Um, and so you really, you, it's important, it's always important, but it's especially important for, for use cases that directly impact people's livelihoods um, or uh, their, their lives more directly where, you know, as opposed to something like where you're just recommended a movie or something like that, right? Um, so it, we have to think about a way to do this comprehensively, to have a unified understanding of, of potential sources of, 
unwanted consequences. Those unwanted consequences can actually creep in at any part of the ML life cycle, right? So it's it, the data is one part of it, but there's increasing evidence that it can, can happen anywhere in the pipeline. Um, and bias and fairness, it really, this must become, if it isn't already, a key understanding, a, a key dimension of the, the development life cycle. So closely inter it's very closely inter intertwined with other things like robustness, accountability, privacy, trans trans transparency, and control. But companies must think about it holistically in, uh, in the context of the entire ML pipeline, um, all the way from design to to development, and then finally, they must, uh, they really should have monitoring for, for, bi uh, for uh, bias and fairness continuously in order to make sure that you, you don't just fix the problem once, but it, that it, it remains um, something to, to watch out for um, as time goes by. I mean, this is one area where, you know, explainable monitoring sort of really shines. As an engineering leader, I strongly believe in this idea of trust but verify. And what I really mean is that, uh, you know, as we're leveraging these massive data sets and advanced AI technologies to create leverage for the business, it helps to have checks and balances that are automated so that we can kind of uh, quantitatively measure the gap between the intention and the impact. And, uh, and, and without this, sometimes, you know, performance can degrade due to data, data rifts and sort of other macro changes without really sort of knowing. It's also worth noting, uh, you know, that there's no single person that has, you know, lots of specific control or influence about this. And many folks are just working asynchronously to sort of improve the collective performance of the AI systems. Uh, and individual conscious and unconscious bias can over time creep in, even though no single person is, you know, controlling at the macro level how the system must behave. And so it's important to have these automated checks and balances. There are now like uh, sort of uh, amazing tool sets around fairness indica indicator libraries. Fiddler provides that tool, TensorFlow has it, PyTorch has it. And so just having rigor around measuring it as part of your monitoring can go a long way to ensure that uh, random degradations that are unintentional degradations don't happen. So I, I, have, I have some thoughts on this just in the sense of, uh, I mean, I think that it's super important, obviously. Um, and I think that when people think about responsible AI, I think sometimes they think about responsibility in, in the wrong sense of the word, where, you know, or responsible in the sense of society or, or you know, doing good. But it, in a different sense, I think that if companies think of it as, you know, we are responsible for the outcomes of this model, somebody needs to be responsible for what happens here. I think that that forces the issue of thinking about, you know, exactly what we're talking about, of how do we have explanations? How do we have monitoring? How do we have uh, things like that? Because, you know, if humans, you can build products and humans can make decisions that have bias without ML, but somebody's ultimately responsible for that and can be held accountable for that. Just because it's in an AI black box doesn't mean that nobody's responsible. Somebody still needs to be responsible. Pete, I'm waiting for you to chime in, um, but I, I do have a follow-up question based on some of the, the similar comments y'all have made, so. Uh, I'll, I'll go for the follow-up question. Okay, and, and that is, so whose responsibility is it to ensure these things are not biased? It, is it just up to the IC data scientists developing the model to ensure that they're, uh, you know, checking their data sets and ensuring that they're adhering to best practices, or does it does it also include other stakeholders, either within a data science team or platform team, or even more broadly within risk or compliance or legal, or even uh, you know PR, for instance? Yeah, um, I think it is everyone's responsibility. But that said, um, when it's everyone's responsibility, it's often no one's responsibility. Um, so if you're in a large enough organization, I think. Um, like a chief data officer is usually a good uh, point person for this kind of thing because it does touch on so many different roles. And so what I've seen, whether it's with compliance, um, GDPR, whether it's fairness, these things that um, touch on where different systems talk to each other uh, can fall even within data, right? You can have several different engineering teams, someone dealing with the events that are flowing, someone dealing with model building. Um, when it makes a transition from one team to another, that's where things fall through the cracks. 
Um, and so it's good to have someone who has like an, a, a bird's eye view of everything um, and is responsible for these things that cut across the company. Um, and so, you know, there can be, um, you know, there are chief diversity officers as well. Um, you, some companies we, we had, um, after my company was acquired, we hired in um, a, a director focused on uh, AI ethics. Um, and, you know, so you have to be, I think, of a, of a certain size to support that level um, uh, of, of personnel. But um, I, I, somebody need, it needs to be somebody's OKR, basically, right, to bring in the product management side. Um, because, and, and, and I think the other practice that uh, I think helps with this are things like pre-mortems, right? So you, do, you don't have to, um, you, you have to put yourself in the shoes of all the different types of people who could be using your product and think about how it's gonna work for them and then actually inspect and interrogate and, and, and look at how it's working for different groups of people. And, and I'll just follow that with, you know, at Fiddler, as we've begun to, we've, we've been hearing about bias concerns from many of the customers we've engaged with, but again, there doesn't seem to be a consensus on how to even approach the problem or who should approach it. And so what we've been trying to do is put together a high level framework that can at least showcase where there might be sources of bias and then allow customers to take from those insights uh, what that you know take action from those insights basically and and determine whether for instance they might want to retrain a model or, or balance their data set or um, continuously monitor over time and and use those insights to adjust uh, their applications so okay we are coming up on the hour this has been a fantastic conversation and there have been several audience questions that i want to make sure we have time to get around to so i'm going to go ahead and transition to that really quickly and the first one is, how do you measure accuracy of explanations? Um, and so this is an interesting topic and it, it somewhat is specific to the particulars of the model that you're trying to explain and even the explainability or explanation algorithm you're employing. But uh, the Fiddler platform provides confidence intervals for our explanations. And so depending on the method used, and there are trade-offs between these algorithms. Some, for instance, traditional Shapley-based methods require a lot more compute, but can be much more accurate. Whereas others, for instance, random feature ablation are much speedier, but less accurate. And so depending on the method employed and the type of model being used, um, you know, we can display it and help showcase the confidence of an explanation. I mean, just one thing to sort of worth highlighting here is uh, that there's a difference. We should decouple the effectiveness of the model and the effectiveness of the explanation. Mm -hmm. so the effectiveness of the model is a function of, you know, one's understanding of the domain and the features and so on and so forth. And the effectiveness of the explanation should largely be judged based on if certain features were not there, what would be its impact on uh, the overall score? And, and that is kind of a, a, maybe a more fair way to measure the effectiveness of the features and, 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 and thereby measure the effectiveness of the explanation. But is the model effective? That's kind of a separate question, at least uh, just to decouple and have roles and responsibilities clearly stated. And, and actually related to that is there are two aspects to a good explanation. There's the accuracy of it and then the intuitiveness of it. So can you actually make sense of the explanation and utilize it to make improvements to your model? And so it's important to balance both of those aspects when you're implementing an explainability framework. Okay, so the next question is, in the context of monitoring deployed models, how does the monitoring of the models compare to improvements or deteriorations of model interpretability? In other words, what metrics are in place for ascertaining a better interpretation versus a worse interpretation. And this is somewhat related to the question we just answered. But ultimately, the trade-offs of performance and interpretability are made when you're deciding what type of model to use. For instance, a, a very uh, complex ensemble deep learning uh, model versus, you know, a, a linear model. And traditionally, there have been trade-offs between interpretability. If you look at the financial industry, uh, Oftentimes, many banks are still using quant models across their ecosystem because they're inherently interpretable, at least more so than machine learning models. But as the explainability research has 
uh, you know, has developed uh, and new algorithms have been developed for more and more complex models, for instance, integrated gradients for deep learning. Um, these companies have been enabled or empowered to transition toward more complex models with the confidence that they can be explained. Um, there was another question about what is the practical makeup for success around skill set diversity within a machine learning team? Practical does not mean ideal. Um, I think maybe Abhishek or, or Kenny or, or Pete, if you want to take this. Yeah, so well, I, I, skill sets. well I, I think that it depends on kind of what you're going for. I think that as ML continues to grow and expand, there's going to be more specialization. So it depends if you want to be, you know, a data scientist, an ML engineer as kind of a new emerging thing of focusing on that, that software engineering side of things, um, you know, or really focused uh, on, on, you know, like the monitoring and the, and the things like that. Um, so I think that that there's a lot to be learned from traditional software and asking, you know, how can we bring those concepts to the world of machine learning and specialize? No, uh, absolutely. I'd say the following, you know, at a very kind of fundamental level, you need people who are sort of good at software engineering uh, because, you know, you have to run models at scale. Uh, you also need folks who have some sort of background in mathematics uh, that sort of allows them to understand sort of machine learning models uh, and sort of uh, operate them to feature engineering. So those are sort of the main sort of fundamental skills. And then depending on the domain, uh, one may want folks who have some sort of vision background or NLP background and, and so that can vary. But if we are sort of uh, talking about the basics, those are the main things. And that can come through education, that can come through sort of boot camp, that can come through a wide variety of sort of uh, places or folks just contributing sort of open source. Uh, but that's really the, uh, the core of it. Awesome. Well, we are at time. And thank you so much to the panel and everyone who attended. I hope that the conversation was useful and interesting.